Sama Sambudasa Nama Chasa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Nama Chasa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. The question has come up repeatedly about equanimity. And it's just not what the dictionary really says it is. This is the kind of thing that you run into. There is a guarantee that you cannot really teach the Buddha Dhamma from an English dictionary. There were some professors in Sri Lanka that were friends of mine uh, that really thought they wanted somebody to take it on as a graduate thesis to work on a new dictionary in English to explain the Buddha Dhamma terminology uh, because you can't do it. It's a certain, you run into too many blocks on key words. So we're gonna do a dance tonight with equanimity and really so you can see how we try to figure all this stuff out. The first thing we go to is um, uh, the sources, the reason we always use the thesaurus system instead of just the dictionary is because once we have a meaning of a word in a dictionary, that doesn't help you to have an easier word. Now, Deep is a writer, she's a content writer, and she knows what I mean. You're, when you're writing, you're not supposed to use the same word over and over and over again. So you need variations. And with equanimity, it's interesting because there's so many different levels of equanimity. Now, this is a real key point in our meditation because of where we're attempting to go. Or if we're a lay person deciding how far am, am I going to go with developing my meditation and living a lay life. And that's the other part of what I want to talk to you about tonight. We have students that are confused about this, and they, they tend to read, go back into the text to read, but they're not careful to always check when you're reading a sutta who the Buddha was teaching and take into consideration, because they don't know how to take this into consideration. If he's talking to the monks, is it for what they're doing with their meditation, which is not necessarily what everyone is doing with their meditation if they are a lay person. See, we have people shaking their heads, right? And this can get us in trouble in funny situations, but also in serious situations. So sifting out, the going back, what is the problem, the, the core piece to this? We have to go back and examine what equanimity was about from the beginning of your training, from the beginning. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. But first, we want to look at what the, might be the definition for equanimity. So where are the ridiculous glasses? Tell me I didn't put them someplace where I can't get them. <laughs> well, okay, we'll be lucky if I can read. We had my glasses changed and I don't have them yet. Let's see if I can work this out. Okay, so equanimity, if we look at it as a noun, and it is a descriptive work, word as well. But in here, we look at it as a noun. We can substitute composure, presence of mind. Uh, we can take uh, level-headedness, which is backing up and having common sense. Level-headedness is an old term for common sense. Backing the up and seeing what is actually happening in a situation, what is the real issue that's occurring in the here and now, or am I sitting here looking at a, an event with between you and me, and I'm thinking already constantly, what is this like from the past? And that's what gets us in trouble with suffering. We start 
reacting immediately because this must be just like what happened with the other thing in the past. We do it immediately. It's very funny. Or we start worrying about what someone told us might happen in the future. And we, we want to know, is this going to be what they were talking about in the future? Is that going to jump up? So that's a problem in the relationships with people. So equilibrium is in here, poise, these are cute words. These are calmness, calm, coolness, cool headedness. Serenity is good, placidity is good, tranquility is good. Then they jump, you see, from those words into words we hear in Buddha Dhamma, which is you are moving towards imperturbability, big word, imperturbability. So M means not, perturbed was the key word. You, you, I get perturbed if you keep doing this to me, I, or saying it, or I keep hearing it. I get annoyed, frustrated, irritated. That's what perturbed means. Same as the word disturbed. So when we're looking at the attainments, if we're talking about them, we're talking about reaching a point where our mind is not going to jump and be disturbed or perturbed about things and react really fast. So this is the, this is the tie in that uh, Professor Premissary actually was noticing too, I'm sure, of, of what happens um, when you start talking about bhavana just being development of mind. We're developing the mind so it's more stable and we're looking at how the mind is the forerunner of everything that happens in the whole body operationally, but also emotionally and reactionary in behavior, okay? So when we're looking at this whole thing, uh, we're, if we're working with the mind, we're working with the key, with the doorway to this, the, the real source of the problem. And then it goes on to equilibrium and stuff like that. Now, I'm going to show you an awful chart, and I'm not sure if I can move around on the chart. I could on the computer, but I'm not sure once I have it on the board, I'm not sure what will happen and if I can even read it, but let's see if I can bring it up, if it's there, yeah, here we go. It's kind of dark, okay. This is a chart that took, oh goody, we can do this, okay. This is a chart I spent five and a half or six to seven months, I think I was, the whole seven months I was there really, but I started at the second month, so five months building this chart because I had questions. So what in the world is this chart? Well, first of all, I noticed something about what's at the top of the chart. There are six words, and I give a little class on these six words, and you call them like a summary track. And this summary track reminds me immediately what my practice is about. So I don't forget, and so that I can uh, carry it with me and use it in life, I can always remember, if I remember th these words, the meditation is uh, observing the movements of mind's attention to see how everything works. That's what I'm really learning how to do, a special skilled kind of observation that is fascinating, that will go to the deepest parts of mind and even watch uh, mind moments pop up. Second word is mindfulness. Mindfulness is your power of observation, uh, the actual power of the observation. So the meditation is using that power of, of, of observation specifically to see how everything actually works and to discover whether the life, um, the life on the life continuum line is everything happening to me and that's why the world feels so heavy? Or do I have any power in this at all? Am I able to control anything? And the answer definitely is yes, but not until you understand how everything works. And so this mindfulness is 
your power of observation as you're learning to do the practice from the beginning all the way to the end. Delusion is the third word, and we chose delusion because delusion here means uh, it's crazy when you look it up in the in dictionaries and stuff. It's not hard, very hard to figure out. It's not that you have a, you're deluded means you're a, a muddy mind. It isn't like that. It is the false idea of everything is me, it is mine, and it is myself. And if it isn't, boy, I want to just check out because if it's me, it's mine, and myself, then I control everything. But if it isn't me and mine and myself, I'm not sure what my position is, but I'll tell you something. One time a guy came to the Buddha and he wanted the Buddha to teach him uh, the meditation. And uh, when he went to, uh, at, to ask the Buddha, you know, when he went to ask the Buddha about this, the Buddha said, why do you want to learn the meditation? Why? Do you want to practice? And the man said, because I've lost control of my life and I want to gain control of it again. The Buddha just sort of looked at him. And then, of course, he was, he looked at him probably and analyzed whether he would learn it or not. <laughs> but then he said to him, of course, I'll teach you. But when I teach you, you're not going to like it. And the man said, why? What's wrong? He says, because I'm going to ask you to let go of controlling everything in order for you to watch how everything actually works. Because that, that's all he said. And the man's mouth dropped open. He said, like, you're going to do, why? I mean, I want to gain control of it. But see, what he didn't tell him, the man, he came and he studied. But what he didn't tell him was, if you will just follow through with what the Buddha is asking you to do, you do end up in control of everything in a much more complete way than anybody else could that said they're in control of their life because you have been given the inside information and you haven't been given it, you have seen it. And when you see how things are working, you're in complete control because then you can learn how to train your mind to let go instead of grabbing onto the hot coals of suffering. The fourth word is craving. Delusion is what causes the craving, this tanha. And craving, the symptom is what you need to remember, the I don't like it mind and the tension and tightness and how you want to change what the truth is at this time. You want to change it and make it something other than what it actually is. Instead of learning to work with it as it is or set up a replacement and replace it and go forward, you see? The fifth one is retrain the mind. And the system he gives you, this escape plan, was right effort and right mindfulness and right concentration. When I say concentration, I have to define it and say very careful, gented, gentle collectedness of mind. In the, the Sudimaga, in the first page, it talks about, in, this, in the concentration section on the first page, it, it does say productive level of concentration. So if we go and say, well, what did the Buddha say was, um, was good meditation and what was bad meditation? The only time he ever made a comment that we found so far was the discussion with Ananda. I'm trying to find where it was for somebody because they asked me to. And, but all he said was good meditation is a meditation that allows you to go smoothly down the path and reach the experience of Nibbana. And bad meditation was a meditation that didn't lead to being able to go down the path and, and open the mind completely with that experience of Nibbana. That's all he would say. He wouldn't go into any other details when he was pressed in the conversation. Purification is the sixth one. The sixth one is uh, the purification is the shift 
in the behavioral patterns from the unwholesome to the wholesome or what a more modern way of saying is skillful and unskillful. So unskillful changing to skillful ways of handling things and dealing with things and processing. Okay, but we use the, the translation of unwholesome and wholesome, which are the definitions from the Pali. You change reaction into response. That's the deal with the purification. That's the deal with it, okay? Now, when you look at this chart, you see not just in the case of, um, in the case of the e e equanimity, but also in the case of everything that's on this chart. And we started with equanimity. That's what actually um, tripped it off. That is what actually started the conversation. We can look at that one first just for fun. Um, okay if you look at this where it says the third one you come into a temple and you're quiet so you write down quiet and then they tell you to sit down and they tell you to be still so to be still is a directive towards equanimity when they tell you to be still close your eyes and be calm there's another word calm then when you experience, when you do experience pasadi, which is part of the development that happens to you in the Upanisha Sutta, the development chart that we looked at, when you experience joy, whenever you experience joy in your practice, it will always fade away. But what happens if you're watching carefully is when the um, joy fades away and then tranquility is what's left. And tranquility is much stronger than just being quiet and still and calm. It's much, much more still. It's something that isn't usually experienced much in life at all. Normal life without any training, okay? And then what happens is this tranquility will fade away also. And when it fades away, then what arises in place of it is called sukha. And sukha, sukha means happiness, okay? I don't know what's happening now. This is always fun for me. Um, always fun. I don't know. Everybody wants to tell me what to do here. <laughs> okay, so I, I just, I can't get to an X. What do I do, Dami? What do I do? Bunty, what do I do? I don't know. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know how to get rid of you, chart. There's no place to cancel there. Okay. Now, Suka, basically, if we were trying to give you an adjective for this, would just be contentment. It's happiness, but it's Buddhist happiness. And Buddhist happiness is not this vibrant kind of excitement type of thing that you see happening in lay life a lot all around you. It doesn't mean there's not a ha ha, you know, or something is funny briefly, but it means that it isn't constantly this heavy vibration of energy going on that you see in lay life a lot of times when you talk about happy. Very, very different, it's contentment. It's a feeling in your gut that you are very, very calm and quiet in your gut. The next thing that happens as it's developing um, is that the, um, this is right, 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 okay. The next one that happens is collectedness and this is a gentle balanced concentration it is the samadhi that the buddha was talking about and this interesting thing is that uh, rice davies did have an interesting thing when he went in his dictionary to look up samadhi in the rice davies dictionary you should be able to find a sub note that he put in there about the word samadhi he just dis disagrees that samadhi 
uh, means uh, concentration. He doesn't believe that because he believes that this was the name of what the Buddha was practicing, and this is the name for um, his his practice that he presented to people in order to go on the path easily and go on. He, the reason he says that is because ekagata was the word at the time, he points this out, that was used to represent uh, concentration and samadhi was a word that came after the Buddha happened. And so his point is, he's very viable on this. It's very good reasoning that it's probably what he named his practice. When Bhante and I look at this, we look at it from the source of Sama and D. Sama is Samatha is serenity, and the D is the source word for wisdom. So we say this is a tranquil wisdom meditation, but it's a tranquil wisdom insight meditation where the serenity and insight are yoked together again, the way it was noted in the suttas as being evenly yoked together. The next word for the, um, the level of equanimity is the um, disenchantment section that you move into, which is the nibbida, and then into dispassion, which is even deeper. And disenchantment really means you're disenchanted with unskillful means, unskillful um, sights, sounds, smells, odors, tastes, actions, and thoughts. You're more enchanted with finding out how far this goes. And my feeling is at this point is where the break should be for people who don't want to go all the way into dispassion, that we should be making sure in comprehension we understand disenchantment is one thing, dispassion is another. When the person goes as far as um, uh, viraga, or viraya, right? Viraga, viraya, no, that's not right. Yeah, the dispassion. That can be a problem in relationships unless you're both practicing and you both have intentions of going as far as you can and have already made an agreement. If I go this really far in this, I'm going to go and be a monastic because at this point, between disenchantment and dispassion, the sex drive just simply drops away because it, it was there for procreation is the reality of the sex drive. And, you know, Dr. Ruth did a really good idea for the drug companies and helped them make a lot of money with the blue pills so men could do this forever and ever, amen. But, <laughs> but, the, but the point is, it's not what was naturally intended for the human beings and the golden years and the mellow years and the mature years and how people spent time together in the aging of their relationships and stuff was the original setup in the beginning. Where it went, it comes back to all of the un, unskillful um, personal and conceit and ideas of I have the best at this and I'm the young, got the youngest wife and all the rest of it, it keeps going like that. I guess just stuff that goes on in life. Imperturbability, akhoba, akhoba. I got, I really say that one, okay. The imperturbability is your mind just doesn't move. And that's what I was wanting to explain to you uh, for a minute about this. I want to come back to where you are, but now I can't remember how to do it. Whoops, I did, I missed. Whoops, no, I um, stopped. Uh, window is closed. Okay, here we go. Okay. So, when I was on the mountain, to explain, first of all, the, this, the strength of equanimity, one thing I was, oh, oh, we go back to the chart for a minute. I forgot the dots. I have to show you the dots on the chart. Where, whoops, oh, don't tell me that's gone, gone. That's not good news. 
is that good news? Is that bad news? <laughs> I can't remember if it's bad news or good news. Let me see. I might have to go out of here and go get that picture again. Just a second. I can do this. I can. You know, um, gee, I feel like Atlas. I can do it. I can, I can, I can. Go into the works here and take a look at the gradual chart and open the gradual chart up, right? Okay. Come on, sweetheart, let's go. There. Okay. Um, am I back? I don't know if I'm on the... Now I go back to you guys. Where are you? You're here. Okay, here. Okay. Um, I don't see it. <laughs> it's open, so maybe it should be there now. Let's see. How do I do it? <laughs> okay, here we go. In the bottom of this chart, one of the lines that we used for figuring out for the alignment of all of this, we looked at the jhanas, okay? And this was really fun, you know, I have to tell you how this happened because it was kind of funny. I was in the Buddhist studies department at the university and they just remodeled the building when they put me in an extra office while I was there. And I was working at the medical school, but I was always spending my time for what I was having to do during the day. I was in the Buddhist studies department. And the dividers they put between the offices didn't go to the ceiling. It was like cubicles that were set up. And the bottom was a wainscoting, a wooden part for three feet up. And then it was a glass top that was a, a sort of a, um, you couldn't see through it. It was a frosted glass. On one side, it was bumpy. But on the other side of your room, you would have a flat side. Well, it didn't take me long to figure out that I could, I could use markers on, dry markers on this window. And then one by one, the professors would drop into the office and say, well, you should put this here and you should put this there. And what do you think? And they'd tell me why. And then I'd do more research and then I'd figure it out. So finally, this is what we ended up with. That's how it happened. So anyway, when you're looking at the jhana line, you start, you start where it says number 10, okay? And when you're following that line down, you see the first jhana. When you get to the first jhana, you see one dot. Now, this is something that one of our students pointed out to us. Unless you have this much of sort of baby equanimity, just being born, just beginning to happen, coming up for you, you can't stay in first jhana. So that's sort of an element that has to do with it that's in the first jhana and when you get to the second jhana we decided that a two-legged we talk about it like animals in sunday school one-legged animal tips over and falls down all the time a two-legged animal in the second jhana is better the three-legged animal is like a tripod in the third jhana, uh, jhana but it can still fall down and you're going in and out in this practice the difference in our practice the reason it's uh, actually so healthy and for a lot of people, it doesn't stress them out and they come out of the practices very relaxed and they are not um, uptight and it doesn't hurt when they get up to walk away if they've been there for an hour and a half or two hours. They just get up and a little bit of stretching and just walk away. It doesn't hurt them at all. It's because you're not concentrating really, really, really hard. Your interest is in concentrating to the productive level where you can watch everything happening inside. Now this third jhana is stable, but when you go into the fourth jhana, it's four-legged. If you take four fingers and just put them down on the table, it's really solid. You know, what, like, a, like a horse on all four legs or an elephant on all four legs, whatever, a dog standing there on all four legs. It's really solid on four legs, okay? You need this stability to happen in the fourth jhana as a secure form of equanimity to be established in order for you to experience going into 
the uh, infinite space and infinite consciousness and the base of nothingness and you need it by then it's there automatically these things are all trained into your mind and your body through repetition so everything we're talking to you about the brain is really solid information about this neuroplasticity and the idea that anybody can be changing even my uncle changed, I'll tell you, he changed and he was 92. And a lot of people said he'll never change. Boy, he changed when he was practicing. His way of practicing was different. But the point is, the reason he changed, when I look back on his practice, and I, we, we had many conversations, he was a really good supporter for me when he was alive. But the way he was learning what he was doing, was definitely from repetition, continual repetition. So you see, when, um, when you hear, now I wanna get out of here again, how do I do, let's see, um, stop share, okay. When, when, you, when you are talking to people about this, they'll say, yes, but this is not the hardcore meditation like the, the when buddhists do meditation they have to do it really hard and continually and for months at a time and this kind of thing when you're pushing through yes that's absolutely true and when someone from that school says to me that what's in 111 in anupada sutta what is describing the, the levels that we pass through and they say oh that's not real that's not real for them, they're not lying. It's not real. They could not possibly see the kinds of things we are teaching you how to see. Why? Why? Because of this, because of closing off completely, just completely closing off like this, pinching the brain, causing stress in the mind. They don't think they're going to create that, but that's what's happening. You see, that pressure in the mind, that squinting in the face of, this is why they get come in with these lines here. I had lines all across here and lines here. Bundy took care of that boy. <laughs> I took care of it. It will go away it, it, because when you relax and smile, you relax your face. The more you smile, that will go away. You don't need a beauty cream. <laughs> You, you need to be smiling more. This is the truth of this, you see. And now they're coming out with more recent research about this that's very special. And they're pressure, talking to us a lot about the repetition, repetition. So what I'm getting at is they might say to you, uh, someone who's been a Buddhist a long time, but you see, you can never get to Nibbana. You can never have those experiences because that's only for monks. We even hear groups of monks say that to people. No, that's for monks. This is for you. No, no. The whole thing was for you. But you have to do it gradually and you have to understand it as you go along. What's imperative is working with the teacher that is seeing the fact you have to have comprehension here and you have to have meditation here and they're going along at the same pace. That's what you want to have happening, see? It's very, very, very true. When a person gets in trouble, if we listen carefully and look at the situation, say, what's, how did this get in trouble? It got in trouble because they plunged ahead with their on their own with the meditation. Yeah, but I'm gonna do it, okay? Yeah, fine. But they don't have any knowledge of where they're going with this chart, you see? They don't understand what's going to happen in the Nivida or in the, um, the dispassion, idea of dispassion. Men get really cold to their wives. Wives get very cold to their husbands and things like this. Why? Because they do not understand that they've reached a point of a gift, but if you don't understand and you haven't been taught about it, you don't know it's a gift, you see? So let's look at equanimity from what happened to me for a minute. So you kind of understand the impact of physical impact 
of what in the world happened to me when I almost got killed in a truck, okay, and could very easily just not be here anymore. We were on the mountain, and it's a dirt road six and a half miles long. And we had these college kids up there in the beginning, and this is way back in 2004 when this happened. Now we had this old truck, we needed a truck, so we bought a truck. The truck has a very funny story. I'm not gonna go into the story, but this truck was dangerous because the back of the truck was essentially not hooked onto the frame of the truck, if you want the truth, just barely holding on to it, you know, but they put the muffler system in anyway when they put the truck up and they said it was okay, everything's fine. I took the truck up the mountain and parked it. The other thing was the brake system was the next thing we were gonna work on. When I worked out in the woods in those days, I was working clearing roads after storms and working with chainsaws all day in the forest, clearing up stuff and uh, clearing areas for possibly putting in different buildings and stuff. And I was out there all day and I came back, these college kids wanted their milk. <laughs> this is all about the milk. So they wanted me to go down because somebody hadn't gotten the milk. And would I go down the mountain and get four gallons of milk and come back? Oh, sure. Fine. So I was sitting really quietly. I would work for a couple hours, sit for an hour, work for a couple more hours, sit for an hour like this in the woods when I was working. And I said, sure. I, I went and got in the truck started down the mountain and it wasn't even a quarter of the way down it started to pour just like the monsoon this is a dirt road and it's just turned to mud and now we're getting to a place i don't know if you can see this or not i don't know how i can show you um, okay so you're coming along like this and you're going to make a sharp turn to the left and then it's going to drop down about this angle for about 200 feet towards a sheer cliff in front of you. And then you have to do almost a U-turn to go down again an incline of about another 150 feet or more, and then swing around the bottom of a big outcropping of rock, and then go down one more time and stop before you go into a sheer cliff at the bottom. This happens pretty fast, and when I got there, I thought I was okay, and I forgot about the brakes, and I turned to go down the first piece. There were no brakes, but the funny part about it is all I can remember is, okay, so what do you do when there's no brakes? You keep your mind ahead of you and do what exactly, precisely is needed, but you start to pump the brakes, and I was pumping the brakes, but it wasn't doing any good. I made the first turn, I made the second turn, barely, and then came down. Now what's on the other side is particularly interesting because at the top of that is about a 300 foot drop into the, into the river. And then after the second curve, about maybe uh, about 100 feet, and then at the bottom another 50 feet into a bunch of rocks before the river. And then you're facing a cliff at the bottom. At the bottom, I just did this fancy little footwork thing and it grabbed the brakes and I stopped about four inches in front of the cliff at the bottom. <laughs> you would think there was something going on with me, with my body, with my head, and I stopped. And then what happened was funny. I was a runner at the time. I had been riding bikes, uh, you know, pedal bikes. 150, 200 miles on the weekend and 70 miles every day during the week in training before I went out there. And I sat there and I took my pulse and my pulse was about 58. I said, this is so weird. And nothing happened in my heart. Nothing happened and it should have happened. And then in my stomach, there was nothing wrong in my stomach. How can there be nothing wrong in my stomach? I was, wasn't clear what was exactly happening. So I started the truck again and backed up and then turned and went to the store. By the time I got to the store, I was, I was seriously annoyed 
by probably by the time I picked up the milk and put it in the car, I was annoyed because I explained to the girl at the store, the woman that's there, what happened? <laughs> I was, she was there. I don't know what to tell you. I said, I don't understand. The teacher never said anything about this part of this whole thing. What is this? Okay. So I, I got back in the truck and took this up the mountain and I kind of zoomed up the mountain. The rain had stopped and I got going up. It's not so much a problem. And I just went up the mountain and went straight to Bonte, put the milk in the kitchen and pounded on his door. And he came to the door and, and he said, yeah, how's it going? <laughs> And I looked at him and I, I was irritated. I said, I told him what happened. And I said, and I don't understand why you didn't tell us what this was about. I was genuinely annoyed. Why didn't you tell me what this was about? Because all day I've been feeling really, really level. A couple times a branch had fallen down right beside me and it still didn't bother me. I didn't even flinch, you know, in, in situations where I would get a little bit, you know, upset with <laughs> nothing moved. And I, what is this about? I was really upset with him. And he said, yeah, uh, well, I said, why didn't you tell us about this equanimity? And he just said, well, I did. <laughs> I have been telling you about it in every one of the suttas I've been reading. I've been telling you about equanimity but you don't have to worry about it anymore. And I said, why? And he said, because you're not in it anymore. <laughs> Whatever arises, passes away. <laughs> you see? And then I thought, well, what is this? Everything arises, passes away. Now, all of you need to listen carefully because in this retreat that I just did, at least five of them were so upset because they couldn't have it the way they had it yesterday, today. You see, what that you come, I had a beautiful report and then from somebody and the next day they came in, they were genuinely angry. And I'm like, why are you angry? Well, because something's really wrong because I can't make the, listen, I can't make this happen again. Do you hear this? I can't make this happen again. And I said, well, who told you to make anything happen? You aren't supposed to make anything happen. You don't get it yet. You're supposed to let everything go. You're supposed to never mind everything, not do anything. What are you going to do when you get to nothingness? One person got to nothingness. And I think I thought that the end of the world had happened because every time they're writing me, it's like they're crying. And then one student basically was telling me the whole retreat, the best part of this is my fourth retreat and I'm not here. And the next paragraph he said, and I can't make this do this anymore. And I can't have what I had before. And I don't understand how come I can't control these hindrances. I, I said, well, I thought you weren't there anymore. <laughs> but he was there. He did get it. When you're trying to make anything happen, you're not practicing the instructions. You are not following the instructions in what happened. So this, this equanimity is a real medical condition. <laughs> And it happens that you can talk about it in Shichitsunitsyn's book of uh, getting into the flow in sports, in Olympic sports, if you ever read that book. Getting into the flow is in total equanimity with total complete attention on what you're doing, while you're doing, while you're skiing, while you're tobogganing, while you're skating, whatever you're doing. That's in flow. We're asking you to sit in flow. We're asking you to sit down and do absolutely nothing, except there are words about pain, you know, checking out what you actually did in your practice. Was I too much energy, too little energy? Was my concentration just enough 
productive concentration doesn't mean you need enough concentration to push somebody's car out of the out of the rut that it's stuck in in the road you know you don't have to push you just have to just allow it to pass away now how many i wish i could see you all because how many of you have this problem with your with your hindrances and what we keep reading you are the key phrases about the hindrances. And in 22, the issue with the monk was the only way that some, you see an obstacle sitting on the road, but the only way it can really be an obstruction is if you engage in it. So he's telling you, don't ever engage in a hindrance. So what's the problem? Someone wrote me the other day, I think my problem, my problem is basically that maybe, um, maybe I'm not paying attention to these feelings that come up and everything. Don't pay any attention to them. You don't need to. You want a really sweet life that is very light and happy and joyful. All these things are okay, by the way. Some people believe, well, I'm a Buddhist. I can't have joy anymore. I can't smile. <laughs> Someone told me once, how can you be a Buddhist? You smile too much. <laughs> I said, what, what's wrong with smiling? Well, you're a Buddhist. Buddhists don't smile. I, of course they smile. Yeah. They'll say that Arahat, he doesn't show his teeth. I'm not an Arahat. I'm going to really smile sometimes. You know, but you, my whole thing is you have to look at this this way. Life is here and you have a choice. You can either laugh about it or you can cry about it as you go through it. The teacher who was teaching that way was in Kashmir Shaivism and she didn't have any great area <laughs> it was either you're laughing about it or you're weeping about it but she was also teaching the middle she was teaching the middle in just being where you are the question is can you just be for one day can you and if something bothers you can you never mind Relax, smile, and come back to what you were doing during the day. And I think some people are making really good progress with utilizing whatever they're doing as their practice. I was talking to somebody uh, today and yesterday um, about utilizing the practice. So go and garden. Go get your hands in the soil. Connect yourself with the earth. Plant carrots. This is what I told one friend of mine in Seattle. She never grew anything before. And she was really something. She and her husband, they went and got a small tiny pot in Seattle. And they dug it together and they, you know, put new dirt in and they little bit of fertilizer and really nice. And they planted potatoes and they planted carrots. So they see this green stuff on top. They did plant so many beans. They were just, they wanted potatoes and they wanted fresh carrots mostly. She went to get the carrots with me and I'm not lying to you. She had a whole trunk of her car was full of carrots. She was like a little kid. Look, I've got carrots, you know, and she pulled them out. It was like the delight of a second grader who had planted a seed and found out it could grow in a cup all over again to watch her. She was so excited. Have fun with life. Why choose not to have fun with life? And why would you tell your children to be Buddhist if you don't want them to smile or laugh or anything? That's so silly. Who said that? The Buddha didn't say it. He had a whole section in the Dhammapada on the happy ones, on happiness. And what could be, what is this thing of, uh, you know, of equanimity, what happens to me? If you go too far with it, you can be equanimous at all these different one-legged, two-legged, three-legged, four-legged, four-footed. 
and solid, but you know what it is. All things in moderation. Watch all things in moderation. Learn how everything agrees with the natural laws of what's coming up, what's there, what's passing away. Yeah? I found some things that I don't know if I can read to you because my eyes get really bad in the evening right now, but I found some things. Um, one thing about reaching a level of, of the uh, level of equanimity, and it means stability. Stability where you're not going to move away anymore to a hindrance, a disturbance. What's a hindrance? Uh, a disturbance, a distraction, uh, an obstacle, an obstruction, a blockage, a barrier, a taint, a fetter, a hindrance, something that is blocking you in front of you. It's only going to be serious if you pay attention to it. And the law of Anicca, it's a law. It's like a law of physics. It's honestly real. If you leave it alone, they'll go home and they'll take their disturbances behind them, just like the nursery rhyme when the lambs went away and they took their tails behind them. These hindrances will just arise you didn't ask them to come. You are not required to make a meal and feed them or give them tea. You're just, just sort of, hi, how you doing? Nice to see, okay. I told somebody uh, it's okay when they come up to say, is it from the past? This is an interesting lesson. This is a good exercise. If you haven't done it, do it for a day. There's a paint trash can in this side of my head and that's for anything that pops in my mind that is about the future. And there's a blue trash can right here in my head and this trash can is for anything that pops in my mind that is from the past. 99% of them are gonna be in the blue trash can. You're gonna have to dump them every once in a while, <laughs> okay? Then I have a silver trash can right here in the frontal lobe. And if something, some idea pops up while you were meditating, put it where it belongs. If it's an idea, put it in here. I guarantee it will come back. When you're, after you're sitting, it'll come back to you. When you're driving, after you're sitting, going home, it'll come back to you. Within 24 hours, it'll come back probably. That's usually what happens. If it's in the pink trash can, why would I throw it away? Well, because you don't know what the future is going to be and anything you think about the future is pure conjecture. It's just projecting. You're getting caught in projection. You know, it's like, um, you know, uh, I can't ever go to outer space. I can't train in NASA to get off the planet to go away when the aliens come. Why not? I can't do it because the alien, something's going to be in the ship and it's going to turn me to jello and it's going to bite me or eat me or something. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. Why not? Go to the moon, go to Mars, go wherever you want, but don't be afraid of stuff. You know, this is not, it's not, uh, it's not reasonable. You don't know what the future is going to be. The big one about the future, when the kids ask me, I say, you mean the future like this? And I point to them. And I say, that's what my dad used to say. What do we know about the future? Now look at us. We have to go like this. We take 10 fingers and we go like that. And we say, now look at the future. It could be anything. We got quantum physics. We got a multiple, uh, multiple um, what do they call it? Uh, this earth and the next earth and the next earth and the next earth. You have different realities and different, uh, I'm trying, what's the word for it? I can't remember. And these different, you're in one and you're, there's another one of you here and another one of you here and another one of you there. Why get in? You don't worry about all this stuff. Words. What was it? Tell me the word. Multiverse. What, what? A multiverse. Yeah, multiverse. Multiverse is the, a real consideration. Everybody's studying the multiverse. 
So because of the multiverse concept, we don't know, have any idea what our future will be. We can say if we do this, this might happen, that might happen, that might happen, just the way our parents did or something like that, but we don't know what will happen. So you let go, let go, you see? The past, the truth of it is, this is an issue when people want to share a Buddhist teaching uh, with uh, other people who are not Buddhist. How can I share the Buddha Dhamma with someone who is not Buddhist? If I teach you the line, life continuum line with the past and the future, does that belong to Buddhism? No. Yeah? If I teach you about, uh, you know, about uh, feelings, and emotions, do they belong to Buddhism? No. And it's especially a much more open door to talk about the, the operation of the Buddha Dhamma now because the research that's going on is supporting us so much more than it did before. And this most recent, uh, most recent one about the smiling is a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing. So all you have to do to get to be happy or train yourself to be happy is to put a pencil in your mouth like that. And now if you go around for a day like this in your office, go to the board meeting so you can talk about when you're typing, put a pencil in your mouth like that, right? And you exercise. <laughs> exercise your muscles in the side of your mouth exercise them and when you do that you are you are helping the oxytocins release in the frontal cortex of the brain and you are helping yourself feel more uplifted i think maybe in the health quadrant when the nurses take a break they can drink a cup of coffee but they should just sit there for a little while like that okay I tried it for a while when I was typing today, and I'm there, you know, that's pretty uplifting. <laughs> How does it work? So many things about the human being, and we just don't know yet how we work. We don't really know our potential. We're not sure where they actually, where we really came from, work, and still don't know a lot of things. Okay, this one thing, equanimity, this is a note, uh, it's in the Majima Nikaya, and it's a uh, note number 337. You'll find a note that talks about equanimity is supported by the wholesome. It's called Upeka Kusala Nisita. Equanimity of insight, attraction versus uh, nor aver aversion, looking at these pieces towards agreeable and disagreeable, looking at that, looking at objects that appear at the six sense doors and understanding how we have balance about these things. Everything is, is two-sided. Uh, to understand uh, hate, you have to understand love. To understand love, you have to understand hate. This is theory of opposites in all of this. Now I'm finding that in Buddhism. I was writing a poem about that when I was 15 years old and I was criticized so badly, I didn't turn it into a professor at college because um, I was criticized, it was just awful. And what it was, was this stuff of emotions of, of how do you understand happy if you don't understand sad? How do you understand um, agoraphobia? which means you will not leave your house, that fear of leaving your house. If you go outside um, and you have fear of being, uh, um, fear of coming inside, the two, two opposites here, the two opposites, two opposites. Our whole life is struck with these opposites. Uh, and this is a lesson that the Buddha talks about in some of the suttas. He also talked about um, um, how is exertion fruitful, um, how is striving fruitful, 
And here you should um, um, know that a student who is not overwhelmed with suffering does not overwhelm himself with suffering. And one who has been overwhelmed with suffering will continue to suffer. This is like what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. Did you know that? That's one of the statements in the text. What we think and ponder on is becomes the inclination of our mind. Now, these are fun, these two, because what you think about in the morning when you get up, if you feed yourself that, you know, like sort of getting up in the morning and going, good morning, how are you doing? <laughs> this is the morning and I'm going to have a good day. Now, how far can you go in the shower and through the bathroom and get dressed? Can you do it with a pencil on your arm? <laughs> you know, these are silly things, but I don't remember when our parents told us when we got older, we were not allowed to still have fun. Do you remember that? I don't remember that. Sometimes maybe parents told you that if their parents told them whose parents told them. <laughs> yeah, but the truth is there's no legitimate reason why you shouldn't stop your car, get out, take your shoes and socks off and go put your feet in the ocean for 20 minutes and then go back to work if you live near the ocean. There's no reason why when, um, you uh, take a break for your lunch if you have a lunch hour that you shouldn't get a sandwich and a drink and just pop in the car it's maybe a little hard sometimes there's so many people here but going to a place that's quiet where there's wildlife if you're near a place where you can go where there's just quiet for a period of time and just eat your sandwich and sit for half an hour then go back to work if you can't do that, do you have 12 minutes that you can get into the utility closet? <laughs> I mean, I've taught people how to take 12 minutes inside the utility closet. This one doctor, I told him, just go in the utility closet next to where his office is. In the other utility closet, he set up an office uh, in an oncology department in a hospital in uh, North Adams, I'm sorry, um, Northfield, Massachusetts. And um, Northampton, Massachusetts. And it, I joked with him all the time. He said, well, I don't know how to calm. Sometimes I just get very uptight. And I'd say to him, just climb in the closet, close the door, and just sit there for 10 minutes and just send yourself loving kindness and say, I, if you feel badly about something, I forgive myself for not allowing myself to just be. You can just be for one day. What would it be like? I forgive myself for not allowing myself to just be for a day. And you just be that, whatever's going on. And it's really nice. And you really learn a lot from it. So he says, um, he does not give up pleasure that accords with the Dhamma. And yet he is infatuated with that pleasure. You have to be careful. This is where a person will start practicing the Dhamma and they will feel the joy come up and they will get attached to the joy and infatuated with the joy and want it to repeat. This was the case with the student who kept saying, but why can't it be like yesterday? Why can't it be like that again? Another one, um, it may occur to you, uh, this, this one is, um, not, this is a little twisty turny, but I shall, be tr uh, I shall be troubled and the other person will be hurt for the other person is given to anger and resentment. And he is firmly attached to his view and he relinquishes it with great difficulty. And I cannot make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. Of course, this person can't. The monk can't do that. Why can't that monk do that? Because you can't fix another person, but you can be happy yourself 
and the energy that comes off of you and spreads around affects everyone around you. This is what starts with this one uh, student has changed her father and her uncle and some other relatives affected because she was affect her behavior was affected. So she didn't do anything to them. She didn't explain anything to them. She did. She taught them how to let go by letting go. And the energy that happened from her is what changed everything in the house. Uh, one should not underrate equanimity towards a person who, um, this was the most important lesson for this monk in this story was he should practice equanimity toward this person, meaning to see him in the right concept. That's what equanimity allows you to do when you say, well, I'm not going to pull something like what it's like from before or something what might happen here in the future. I'm going to take this exactly as it. I know, I know. In the South, in South Carolina, there's a story about some convicts who ran, got out of a big prison. And, and there's a very famous story about this young man. They caught two of them, and the third one got away, and they, they tracked him. And he ends up in a farmhouse, totally exhausted in the morning. And he has this woman at gunpoint. And she's about 40 years old. And she says, well, now, son, I've got to tell you, you need to tell me right now what exactly is wrong you have me here at gunpoint this morning. I have not even had my coffee yet. What seems to be the problem? I'll tell you what, bring your gun and come in the kitchen. So she takes him in the kitchen and he still has the gun pointed at her. He's a young man. And she says to him kind of gently, let me fix the coffee now. I got this going and start to perk. So you tell me now, tell me what exactly is the problem here? And he said, I want to go home because my father died and I want to go to the funeral and they won't let me out. Well, now I can see how that would really bother a person in their heart. And just then she heard all those people drive up in the driveway. Now let's not get upset, she said to him. Listen, I know who's coming up the driveway. It's Fred, and he's the sheriff. You let me talk to Fred. You sit down. I'm going to cook you some vittles because you're about the skinniest thing I ever did see. And I know right now you need to be eating something along with that coffee. So sit still. Come with me. I'll talk to Fred through the window. Hey, Fred. Yes, what is it. We got to get that boy out of there. Now listen to me, Fred. I'm telling you, this boy, all he wants to do is go to his daddy's funeral. Can you not be somebody with a little bit of compassion in your heart and let him go to this funeral? Well, I don't know. Are you okay in there? I'm all right. I'm all right. I just got up and I had to get my cough. All right, I'll tell you what, we're staying out here, but you better bring him out. And I don't want no gun or anything. You promise, you tell, ask him now. He has to promise he's going to come out when I tell him he's got to come out. All right, now you sit there, Fred. I'll take care of this. All right, now you hear it, him. you got to put that gun down, and we're going to eat these vittles. And I'm going to listen to you for a little bit, but you're going to have to go. I ain't going. I'm not going unless he lets me go to my daddy's funeral. I am not going. I'm going to shoot this gun. Now, don't be doing something like that, no matter, no matter. And are you okay there? I'm all right. It's all right. Just listen to me. How about if you take this boy over to Colson to the funeral before you take him back to the prison? I'm telling you, he'll come out after he eats his vittles. Well... I guess so we can do that. State troopers, they don't even know where this boy is. Only the gators know and you know, so I suppose we eat them vittles now. All right, then. I'm going to give them the vittles. Y'all stay outside. I'll tell you. I'll ring the bell when we're coming out. Okay. I'll do it. 
Be careful now, Ellen. I would, now, listen, son, you sit down, let me just cook these vittles up just fine and you tell me everything. And so she sat there and she did this. She was so balanced. She knew this boy had a problem. She was a mother. Her own sons grew up. It was a farm, an old truck farm tucked back in near the swamp. She took that boy and she gave him his vittles. He ate, drank the coffee and she ate drank coffee. He cried for a little while while he was talking about his daddy and she gave him a great big hug. And then she said that he was gonna come out. She went out on the porch, she gave Fred that gun, gave the boy and the two men, they were hanging their heads, they'd been listening real close to the house, but they didn't come in, they were just fine. He got in the car and went away. He went to get to the funeral, then he went back to the prison. He knew he wasn't coming out again. It didn't matter. People have to understand. As suffering is working, you don't see the person as a threat. You assume they need coffee and vittles. <laughs> they need some love. And then you see what happens in the end of the story. This is what needs to happen. The problem now is people just are not listening. And that is the problem, you see? So this whole thing about equanimity is about balance. If it's too much equanimity, you are in control. You can step back away from going too deep and start using your practice for a while as far as you went in the practice and using it in your work. You see somebody get angry at you at the office, it's okay. Don't you ever get angry in this lockdown? Have any of you gotten angry at anybody in this lockdown? Of course you have been angry at the lockdown or the government or someone in the house. Everybody has. What we forget is we all operate the same way. And there isn't any reason why we can't decide as intelligent beings to look at the person with compassion first and never mind these things jumping through your head. Find out if they need some vittles. <laughs> Find out if they need some coffee. Find out what it is that's really happening. There's nothing wrong with this between people. It's just that we are being fed an awful lot of bad food right now. We were looking, uh, one lady here where I'm locked down, she looked on Netflix and there must be 50 different films, not particularly good films, but every one of them is about the end of the world. It's about, about, there must be 15 films sitting there. We looked at them together and I said, look, 15 films about a pandemic and we're in a pandemic. Why are you showing us pictures about being in a pandemic? Why aren't you showing us the sound of music or something? You know, I'm old fashioned, but why people are doing this, I don't know. You have to find out, it's your job. Why can't you have a decent drama where somebody doesn't have to curse through the whole entire film? Or they don't have to, the most interesting part of the dialogue or the action in the film is how many people did they kill in the film? <laughs> you know? So what we're all trying to do um, is we are attempting to learn what the Buddha expected of us. And as an outcome, he talks to us basically about embracing what is good, what is kind, 
um, what is full of compassion and forgiveness and loving kindness. Compassion, I don't know if everybody here knows this or not. Some of you might not. Loving kindness, when you practice it, wipes away the possibility of any thoughts of ill will. When it changes into compassion and it moves up into your head, it gets softer. And when you're practicing sending compassion to the directions when it turns softer, then it wipes away any possibility of thinking about cruelty in return to that person for something they did. It stops it. It can't, it's not possible. Compassion is either active or it's stagnant. Someone was in uh, the hospital in a very serious situation and someone wrote and said everyone should send loving kindness. And so a lot of people wrote down, uh, where I send you, may you have loving kindness, may you have loving kindness, may you have loving kindness, and that's it. Well, that was okay, <laughs> but it's just writing it down. The question is, can you sit for half an hour and just think of that person's face and send them loving kindness and support and send them equanimity and balance and safety. Can you do that? Writing down, okay, it's like, okay, what is this worth? We talk about karma, what is this worth? What is this worth? What is that worth? Sometimes I've been in a class where they talk about the value of this, that, and the other, it's kind of funny. But actually doing, there are things that you can do by building your energy and sending out the energy from your body. So is this, what is this loving kindness? Just saying something? No. Is it just doing something? No. The, the core of it is you change your aura and it goes beyond your aura that's just around you. Out. It shines out. And they know this, they, these, these guys are nuts at MIT, they'll measure anything. They measured the energy for loving kindness and came up with information about it and how far it would reach and stuff like that. Because they know there's an energy that comes from your brain, thinking this way, thinking that way, thinking that way, they can measure the difference in what's happening. All of us need to think at least once a day for those people who are working in hospitals, day after day with cases that are coming in and cases that are being counted. It, the, in India, it's such a tremendous number. The other day we just looked, Bet likes to keep track of this and I always can ask her because I can never find it on my phone. And she can instantly tell me 76,500 new cases and 1,000 deaths today in one day. Just in one day, you see, handled. And we don't think about our medical personnel enough. We do not think about them enough, what they're up against, because we are not even in a position for you and me to decide, well, we should actually go and get trained to fill in some of the simple work that's done in hospitals and learn how to do it. How can we set up a school and teach us now in the midst of this? And at this point, our healthcare workers are struggling in all over the world in cases of exhaustion and starting to, some of them starting to die. And how can we replace them? How can we? It's something everybody needs to be thinking about. And everybody can do something. At the very least, can sit for half an hour somewhere at night, sit a half hour for yourself in the morning, sit for a half hour at night, sending out loving kindness and support and equanimity balance to these folks that need this in the hospitals and the clinics all over. So I'm gonna throw out uh, questions now and you, we can jump in a direction wherever you wanna go. 
do we have any questions that we've done uh, so far? And are there any problems you're having with your, you know, during your meditation? Hmm? Can we do that? Bhante, are you here? Yeah. I'm not sure where anybody is right now. <laughs> Bhante? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm okay. sorry. Um, so, Yes, um, I really, I really like the chart that you were uh, posting. And actually, at one point, at, at some point, you know, before the session is over, I would like you to put it back again so that I can actually take a picture of the whole thing. But um, the um, the thing that is sticking with me that is really important that you said is, in a way, is like I'm just trying to paraphrase, is like understanding what meditation is for. So that's basically like what you're going to be observing through the meditation and then how far you can go, especially for us who are still lay people, you know, and we don't know what's going to happen later. And then, mm -hmm. um, and until where you want to go, I can do at what, at what point one, one person decides, you know, um, you know, how, how this is going to affect your life as a lay person and, you know, and whether, this is you know um that's a lot of questions <laughs> do you have, do, yeah no no but these are yeah. more like statements that, 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 that were left yeah. in my head so i'm just yeah. trying to just yeah. kind of like a formulate formulate you know the 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 take the takeaways from what you were saying oh that's good so, that's good you're taking yeah. notes all right so yeah do it again for me so i can jot it down do it again from where sure. you went the so, point so so the first one was like um, because you were talking about bhavana, the process of bhavana, and, and then you pro yeah. you you you, pr you put the the picture of the um, of the chart, which is an amazing chart. Um, a lot of points to be taken from there. You talk about the jhanas, um, and and so one of the things was uh, understanding what meditation is for. So that's like like what are what are your what is your object? Of, what are you you going to be observing through? Right. Meditation? Okay. Mm -hmm. Then 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 understanding you know, how far uh, you can go and then um, until where you want to go. Okay, those, those were the, the little takeaways that I had uh, from, from what, I, what I had. You said a lot of things, but I just wanted to kind of yeah, get I the know. juice of that. Yeah, um, okay. First of all, the bhavana, like I said, is the development of your mind. And the offshoot of that is you're developing behavior patterns that are more skillful in life. These are not just concerning meditation, but concerning everything in life. Because you drop away from reacting and start to be responding. Um, one of the things um, I want you to do after this is over is call Dhamma Gavesi, because I want you to do the next uh, uh, the next one of my retreats. I only am doing four or five people and I'm working with, you're one of them I wanna do. It's, um, he'll tell you what that is, all right? Um, the, the jhanas are not closed. The jhanas are open to everyone. The jhanas um, are in, there's two schools of what jhanas are. And the one side is, is more on the side of the descriptions and the direction that the Vasudhi Maga, the commentary takes you. The other side is where the, the, um, the text and what the Buddha exactly said and how he trained his own monks going in that direction. And people ask me once, what are you, some kind of fundamentalists? Because I'm always telling them where things are in the suttas. Sound like a Baptist fundamentalist or something like that, <laughs> you know, religious one. But I guess we are. I will, I'll be honest with you. I guess we are sort of fundamentalist in that we want to go to what the Buddha said first, and we want to test that and see if it works. If it doesn't work, we want to test the wording and see if we're just understanding it a little bit differently. Will it work then? That's how this all got developed in the 20 years I've been working with it, okay? And so our 
jhanas are different than the jhanas they're working with because the, there are absorption jhanas from concentrating on an object really hard, but there's no place in the text that says you should concentrate on an object of meditation really hard. No place, it doesn't say it. And then if you um, talk about the experience, when, you, when we're teaching here the fundamental, the uh, foundation program, we were trying we were explaining from the beginning what is meditation what is mindfulness and then meditation and mindfulness are actually not separate they're they can't they're like this they're conjoined in the respect of like we say um uh, feeling perception consciousness are conjoined these three pieces are conjoined you cannot feel without consciousness and without perception that you're feeling you cannot have perception without feeling and consciousness. You cannot be conscious without feeling perception. When we talk about meditation, we have the same sort of thing, like they're kind of hooked together like this. Hook, they can't operate separately. So when you go to work and you, you, you practice your mindfulness of paying attention to what you're doing in the present time, and if you're pulled away from something, you use your cycle that we teach you in the meditation of recognizing your beginning, your, your attention is actually moving away. And so you let go, you relax, smile, and come back over and stay with what you're doing at work. So when I teach judges and lawyers and uh, doctors and people that are CEOs and stuff like that, they use this a lot in their, in their offices, the pr actual practice. They're really good about that. Some people don't get to. it. Mm -hmm. I used it this week uh, because I had some presentations I had to get ready for, and um, and I always struggle with mind wandering, and so I I just six hours every time, every time there was a distraction I just six hearted and and then I was able to get back into whatever I needed to do. One thing we have to be careful of with the six hours is that we don't find ourselves in a in a problem like with a back pain and we want it to go away. So we're going to try to 6R, 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 6R this back pain. What we're doing when we do that is we're trying to use the 6R like a baseball bat or a shot of cortisone in our back. We're trying to force, use the 6Rs to make the back pain stop. That's not what the 6Rs are for, okay? The 6Rs give us the space in our mind, the let go of the concern, the worry, the stress about the back pain. And as we relax, and we just get ourselves in a better better position sitting or lying down for a little while. And if your back pain is in the lower back or the middle back, the best advice I can give you is take a straight chair, without, preferably without arms, and you turn it sideways so it's like this, and you put your legs up over that, and you lay on the floor with your back on the floor. You understand what I'm saying? I'm asking. <laughs> I'm asking uh, May because she's the one that asked me about this actually. Okay, so look, let me show you. It's very, very simple. But you six, what you're six Ring in this case, what you're six Ring when you, um, why won't that come up now? Let me see. Okay, come on. It's not going to let me do it. I don't know why. When you're, there we go. When you are six Ring. Come on, there. Okay. When you're six Ring, you're six Ring your mind, distress in your mind. Um, and um, May, look, here's a straight chair like this, okay? And uh, the person is going to put their leg up like this from the hip over the chair like this. So this is your foot. Yeah? Okay? and your back is going to lie straight on the floor like that. You see? Your, your, your thigh and the body of the person like this. <laughs> I'm not good at drawing. Yeah, okay, there you go. Rest on the floor. If you do this for 20 minutes, this is worth about $3,000 of advice with back treatment. <laughs> so here's the person's head, okay. They're gonna lie on the floor here, okay? 
and you won't have any stress on your back when you're doing this. It's really cool. And this is something they told me when I was uh, coming out of the hospital uh, to go up and you have both your feet like this, okay? See, like that. So you're using this, <laughs> we don't know where that body is, there it is, okay. Okay, you're lying on the floor, that's what I'm trying to show you, get it? You get it, okay? This, this is a real prime position for total relaxation of your spine. It just lays flat on the floor and your, your leg is up here so you have no stress in your hips at all. So it's not pulling on the bottom. And you, put, you can put a pillow, put a pillow under here, under your neck. You can put a pillow like that underneath the neck. That's it. 10 minutes and then you get up and take a little bit of a walk and you feel an awful lot better you really do okay okay um but see when you're using the six r's i want to give you an idea when i was taught the six r's the first time i got on a bike and took a 30 mile bike ride and went around a curve and i cut my leg i fell and cut my leg and I, I got back up and I wanted to finish that 30 miles. I wanted that 30 miles. And so I kept going and I was, then I got to where the turnaround was and kept going all the way back to where the house was. I cleaned myself up and went over to Bonte. He was at the temple and I, I, I chewed him out. <laughs> I said, look, the six hours, it didn't stop my leg from throbbing and it kept bleeding. And I had a rag around it from my, my bike. I was just angry that it didn't stop. And he said, well, what did you expect it to do? You know, it's not going to fix your body, but it gives your mind. Remember, your pain, arising pain in your body is the same as an arising hindrance. And if you pay attention to the pain, it will get bigger and stronger and it will last longer. It'll hurt more. That's where I learned how to then not use any pain medication, almost nothing, and watch your body. And then when you, when you need to rest, learn when it hurts a certain way, you need to stop and go lie down for a little while and come back to, to really ease it very quickly though. If you can go somewhere and do what I'm telling you, get on the floor and just put your legs up over the chair like that. Immediately you feel this release of, of no pain because the spine is perfect when it's on the floor like that with a little thing under your neck, okay? So our, our six R's are not to make something happen. They're actually to give us the space to think clearly and know what to do, you see? and to let go of the pain actually behaves a lot like the thoughts or other kinds of, of hindrances. But okay, you, you asked me about the jhanas, the two kinds, and the ones we're practicing are aware jhanas. So when you went and you had a presentation, if you were practicing in the jhanas for a while and you were up to the fourth jhana, we could say to you, now try saying, I will sit no higher than the first jhana, the day, the morning that you're going in for your presentation. And then be sure you stop in the men's room and smile for at least two minutes or in the car, two or three minutes, smiling and in the mind, seeing this meeting come out exactly the way you want it to happen. And then go and do the meeting and then tell me what happens. <laughs> Because that's really amazing what can happen if you remove any negative stuff that could possibly happen in the meeting. You're erasing the board and then you're, put, you're setting yourself up to purely do the presentation with a positive, that you see the positive outcome already. You see it when you go in there and your confidence level jumps and your, your accuracy and everything jumps. This is how we use the first jhana and the second jhana. Um, okay, the meditation, what you're observing, 
is how the mind actually works. You know, when you're a beginner, it doesn't sound reasonable, but after you've done this a little bit with us, you begin to understand, I can actually watch individual consciousnesses come up and they're there and they go, come up and they're there and they go, and watch them go by in certain levels, the deeper levels. In the first levels, the idea is to train the brain to do what you want it to do, the inclination to be happy for the morning, the inclination to um, let things go when they arise and not take them personally. These are inclinations, they're intentions, you're developing intentions, sort of. You're fine tuning them, okay? Um, what, you're, what you're watching, um, the whole structure when you i was going through suttas today that i had been through in a long time since i read the book the last time and the whole structure of the suttas are supported by wholesome behavior and everything works unwholesome or unskillful behavior doesn't work the precepts become really important with this for instance if you have a have a practice that's going well at a retreat where you're keeping the precepts absolutely and you leave and then you start drinking it's not going to work anymore it stops it's very sensitive and if you um the the precepts of only talking five precepts here to to regulate this five basic precepts and that's we show you and teach you in the retreats and then we ask you to keep doing them all the time and they're very reasonable, you see? And if you're a salesman and you feel like the urge that you have to drink to be buddies with the other guys, you talk to me. I was a professional singer and I can tell you how to set up the bartender. <laughs> you can fix it so everybody in the room thinks you're drinking if that's what you want, but you're not drinking any alcohol at all. And then you'll begin to wonder, why am I in this room with all these people who are drinking? And you'll want to go sit down somewhere with people who are not drinking and you can really have a discussion. <laughs> So life changes, but, but um, it's, really, it's really interesting how the precepts really do affect this whole thing. And then uh, you said, how far can, can you go in this? That's entirely up to the individual. A person comes and they have never done any meditation. Uh, we have had this happen and they've never read any books and they want to try meditation you put them in and teach them the meditation and they fly down the path and go through the first time and it's no problem how come it works so well for them because they didn't try to mix anything up with these instructions these are really simple instructions gang there's no complications here we we worked very hard to make it so it was easy to understand and immediately effective the way he described it it was, we were hunting for something that was easily, uh, easy to understand and immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection mm -hmm. and untouched by time. Those are the four parameters for what we were trying to find for you. And then when we found it, we found some words that were pretty ridiculous. And what, what are we going to do? And Bonte said, we have to go to the thesaurus because that's where the synonyms are and not change the words meaning, but find out what the actual meaning is that work. And what do I mean by work? Well, if we go back to the chart, what makes it so that you can go from one level in fall into the next one and then fall into the next one and then fall into the next one. And all that information is here. You don't have to make any of that up. It's all, it's all right there. So in showing you and teaching you the path, where it, path education is important, otherwise you wouldn't even know where you are if you got there. You see? Some people will say, don't tell anybody about the path. Yeah, if they say that, then the funny thing is, how will you know when you reach a part or not? See? 
That's like saying it's the story of the turtle and the fish. Did you ever hear the story of the turtle and the fish? Okay. And the fish wants the turtle to come to lunch, the tortoise, the tortoise, he's a tortoise, a land tortoise. And the tortoise wants the fish, his friend, to come to lunch. But the fish doesn't understand what land is. And the tortoise doesn't understand what water is. <laughs> I never found out if they ever got to lunch together. But the point is, in teaching you what to expect, there's nothing wrong with that, in teaching you what to expect so that you know when you get there. And then what was the last question? I didn't write down the last question. How far should you go? Um, that's a matter of relationships. And you know, if you're married, you want the first four jhanas are real interesting and helpful with everything in infinite space and infinite consciousness isn't that bad. Uh, when you get to nothingness, what happens is that some people get very personal about it. It's like, don't bother me. I have to practice nothingness, you know, or don't, don't make noise. Uh, you know, you have to gear this to your family. I work with people that have children and I work with people who both the husbands and wives are, are meditators. And this can be very fun, very fun to be working together and discovering all of this and very useful. But um, there's no question that our ideas about I, I think this is kind of universal on the globe right now. We have a stilted view of sexuality and of, of sexual relations right now worldwide. I, I don't think it's isolated the problem just with the United States. I think it exists in Europe and I think even here, I think there's some stilt about it, you know, about what's happening. Masculinity isn't marked by how often somebody does uh, has conjugal relations in a relationship, but we were we've all been exposed at this point. A lot of us have been exposed to pop ideas about this and the drug companies, and we've been exposed to Dr. Ruth and bless her heart, may she rest in peace. Finally, but in my generation. Dr. Ruth was promote. if you have a cold, it's because you didn't have enough relationship with your husband that week. <laughs> if you're sad, you need this much. And if you're this, it was ridiculous, ridiculous. You know, and some people might adopt, adapt to this, but this is not a, a basic thing for human beings. This was basically a co-creation gift. And we kind of went off sides with this. There's a lot more to the to this to the to the um, um, the bulk of a relationship. Uh, I'll give you something. Someday we'll do the marriage marriage blessing that I wrote, and the, the marriage blessing that I wrote hit five different pieces of a relationship, and it came from crossing the United States. Uh, with Bonte and asking people who went through the Great Depression, how did you stay married for 75 years? How did you do that? How do people have these relationships? And the answers formulated into this thing that had five parts in it that we could see systematically, they were answering these questions this way. And that's how we put that together. So do we have any other questions? Anybody? Um, Sister Kema. Yeah, yeah. I, I just uh, thank you for your pointers there. I just wanted to clarify, actually, the discomfort that I have is not so much of a back pain, but more of um, discomfort in the chest area. And I've had this for a very, 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 very long time. And only recently, I realized that by doing the forgiveness on myself first as an object of meditation, because I realized that it's actually a mental hindrance, not so much a physical hindrance. Um, that has helped a lot. But one of the things that I keep falling uh, into as a trap is trying to analyze the why and not the how. 
um, this hindrance keeps occurring uh, in me because I'm like, if I can figure out the how, um, as in, you know, it's a feeling, but where, which, which contact, and I'm pretty sure it's a mind object that's arising um, because it's, it's mental, I'm pretty sure. Um, and if okay. I can figure out that, yeah. and yeah, eliminate okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, modern psychology has well illuminated the why factor why but the question wasn't why and the Buddha went past why into how how everything works and what he discovers is how to totally um, free up the mind by the way he comes to realize that the way to manage the hindrances is this question is me asking this question, but why? For me, I need to know. That's what that's about. It's the Atta issue. So it's an, it's an I, me, my mind issue, okay? And, and um, once he, he lays it all out, you have a choice of ways to handle it. If you go to student number four, that's the one where he, he decides that when he's in student number four, he is going to handle the solution to the hindrances by the opposite. So he's, he's saying, let it go and, and um, embrace the contradiction. And I actually worked with something before I was in Buddhism, I worked with something that advocated um, whenever something's bothering you, turn around and embrace, embrace the contradiction. So if you're angry, embrace loving the person or forgiving the person. And in this sutta, he's saying, if I saw that someone went in the forest and they were afraid, then I would go in unafraid. He says, when uh, someone is covetous, I am uncovetous. If something in my mind comes up, well, I'm covetous of something. I want something I can't have or someone else has. I, I start, I, can't, I let it go and I'm uncovetous. So you see, he teaches that this is one solution that kind of works. And um, if, you're, if you're with hating someone, then you turn it to loving kindness. If you have sloth and torpor, you say, I am without sloth and torpor, or you get up and walk and do the opposite by building energy, the way we tell you how to build the energy to cancel the sloth and torpor. If you're restlessness, then you set up a peaceful mind. Now, remember, he's the Buddha, and <laughs> he is really in contact with communication with his mind, and he has this really great relationship of my intention will be unpeaceful, and mind just does it. We are in the process of training ourselves to build this conversation ability with our mind. And that's what we're trying to do, is be able to do this eventually. But when we go to other places, we get a picture in, in the nine or 11 speakers that are in this book, we get the one about, um, when have you ever heard me say, in, in uh, 22, he says directly to the monk, when have you ever heard me say, in the Dhamma, that you should have engaged the hindrance at all? Now, when you see that, you begin to wonder, well, what is he teaching here? And eventually, when you read all the ones that are basically about the hindrances, when you go through all of them, you come to the conclusion, he's basically saying, there's a law here. And the law is, if you give nutriment to the hindrance, you're feeding it food. It's cut and dry. Not only don't engage it, when he says don't engage it, he means engagement means giving it personal attention, which is nutriment, which is feeding it. It all translates back to that. Hindrances have food. What are hindrances? Hindrances are thoughts. They're the ant crossing across the forehead, <laughs> you know? 
and their feelings that come in the body or something too. But whatever the hindrance is, the instruction is to release it, relax, smile and come back to where you're, you're going with your object of meditation. It isn't to engage it at all. You're, you're sitting there and you're, you're thinking the same thing I used to think, but you don't understand. And what you're thinking is, you don't, under, you don't understand. I want to know what it is and I want to know how it works and I want to know why it came up here. <laughs> That's what's happening, you see? And it's like the one, the guy who tells me, I'm so glad I'm not here. Everything goes so much easier. And then he says, but I want to control this and I want to make this happen. And I want to know what, well, what's all this I? <laughs> See, what's all this I about? See? And so um, in, in 22, he's very cut and dry saying to this monk, you misguided man, haven't I told you that obstructive things become obstructions only if you engage in them. That's for all the hindrances, you see? Well, everything. So now we play the what if game because I don't want you to believe me. So tomorrow you play, what if this is true? <laughs> what if it's true? And when you listen to the Samyutta Nikaya, I don't have it here with me right now, you listen to, it gets really serious when you get into deeper meditation. Because in the deeper meditation, what do you want to have happen? You want the seven enlightenment factors to come up and you want them to be even. You don't want them to be like this. You want them to be even. So you can fall over into cessation. You can't go into sensation. You can't fall into it unless these, that's a condition for it to happen. So what does he write? The great suit that, you know, we great seven of these. So there's 14 paragraphs in this sutta. And the first seven of them are saying, what will happen if you pay attention to this sutta? To, I'm sorry, pay attention to the hindrance. And you pay attention, too much attention to, uh, you, I'm sorry, what will happen if you don't pay attention to your mindfulness? It won't come, it won't come up properly. And if you, if you pay attention to a hindrance, mindfulness won't come up. Then it says if you pay attention to a hindrance, that the investigation will go wrong, that the energy will be wrong, that the joy won't work. You see what's happening? The tranquility won't work. The concentration won't come into balance. And the wisdom won't come. The equanimity, I'm sorry, equanimity won't come fully up for you the way you need it. Then he spends seven more paragraphs saying, but if you let it go and leave it alone, you don't feed it nutriment. What will happen is that these will come into alignment very fast. They will work, okay? And then you'll be able to go. So it was the nourishment and the denourishment of the hindrances in relationship to the arising or non-arising of the enlightenment factors. It's that discussion that you wanna to go to in the Samyutta Kind. it's on, 1596, go to 1596 page, and then go from there and you'll find it. It's a section on discussions. And that's a big discussion. It summarizes the whole Bojanga section of the Samyutta Nikaya. It's in the Bojanga section, which are the seven pieces, okay? Okay, okay thank Anybody? you, Sister Kema. Yep. Good question. Anybody else have a question? Hmm? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, Deepa. Sister, I have a question. Yes. Uh, connected to what you spoke about relationship. Um, so if you are in a if you are in a harmonious relationship and you use it as a container to go beyond collectedness all the way to impert imperturb 
compatibility uh, along with your partner? Oh, along with your partner, pleasant journey. But, but what comes out of it is sex drive disappears. I'll be blunt, it doesn't, it disappears completely. Sex drive, okay? So mm -hmm. it, it's like when you, when you look at it from the front and you say, oh, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, but when you get there, when you get there, it's like, wow, peace be with you. Life is different. And you begin to understand there's so much more to the mind and to, uh, uh, to the relationship with people that I know some people that have some pretty good relationships going who that's fine. They're both celibate. And what the celibacy has nothing to do with this wonderful relationship they have and everything they do together, teaching and gardening and living together and activities and just everything with their grandchildren and everything. It's wonderful. So it's um, the other part is how if you want to get into a little bit deeper, I won't go a lot into this, but I always wanted to have a women's retreat because I felt like, you know, it'd be great to just have a women's retreat only, you know, to talk a little bit more about this. But both women and men have relationships for different reasons. And the, and the, the, the um, structure of the relationships are different in different marriages, you see. And I think some cultures are set up pretty well for the respect of certain parts of that relationship and that the West doesn't really concern itself with anymore. And then they get into a bit of a problem because if there's not sex, what is there in the relationship? That's a very dangerous position to, to base it on a, a relationship because at some point everything changes, you know? We had a little, um, well, I wouldn't go there, uh, but, but there was a, a question a young woman asked uh, once, why are there so many old men, older men, gray-haired men in beautiful sports cars on the boulevard in Miami? Why are they driving down the boulevard in Miami with, these, with their daughters all the time? <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Well, those women were not their daughters. That's what was going on, basically. A woman and a man are not getting married like this and developing with sexuality the same way. And certain male peaks at one place and woman peaks at another place. And there's all kinds of things to work out in the growth of a marriage, in the maturing of a marriage. Now, if you're in a society where sometimes they talk about these things and it, it's all clearly in the structure of the culture as well, you don't get into that much trouble. But if you're in the West, you can get in a whole lot of trouble because of, of going into a relationship on one basis, forgetting one word, a Nietzsche, <laughs> whatever arises passes away, and whatever was the same yesterday is not the same today and won't be tomorrow. And relaxing into this sometimes, we don't want to, because why? Because I want it to stay the same, the way I like it. And now I finally have it the way I want it to be. And I, you see, I, I just love that. Mexican hat dance. I, 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 <laughs> And I thought about the Buddhist saying, I, 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 it reminds me of, we should all be looking at this little dance the kids did in kindergarten, you see? It's not just about, it's about the other person. Part of this is, has to do with empathy and um, compassion, loving kindness, beyond the erotic love that is on a worldly side over here and is very different from loving kindness and compassion and um, joy and equanimity and balance and understanding and listening and sharing. Wow, you know. And I can count and all the people I've known, only maybe five or six people in relationships that really have this and understand it. They took the time to find it. 
but our elders, the ones that stayed together through the Great Depression that we got to talk to that time when we crossed the country, man, they had to share everything and work really hard to make it just keep going and get through the whole thing and work together for everything, every inch of the way. Everything is transient. Everything is change. You couldn't stand still even if I begged you to because the earth is turning. <laughs> That's what Bunty likes to say. It's impossible to sit still. Any other questions? Hmm? Now, as many of you, we should send out a notice. Everybody should be here Saturday because um, I, I'll send out, um, Major, I will send out a note of what you would need to do for Saturday. So when we do the dependent origination on Saturday, uh, coming back and going and just doing the workshop, uh, everybody has uh, the paper in front of them and is building their own chart when we do this. This is really important. If you have the other one, put it in the drawer and forget it and, and build the chart with us because that's how you're really, really, really going to learn this. And then when you have all the pieces in dependent origination, you'll start watching how everything is happening. And that's the fascination that you don't get to just see it outside, but you get to see it inside and then just in the mind as it's working really fast in the deeper states. Any more questions? Um, just one thing. Um, do you mind putting the, um, the, the graph that you showed, like the entire graph, because I was only able to capture only the chunk. You no, know, it, it's it's not it's not really very good to be taking a picture of that. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it. I'll try to put it up, but it it's um and without an explanation of it, I don't know what good it's gonna do. I was I was giving it to only for giving it to only for what we were talking about, but actually um, and, and it has to be rebuilt too. That's why I never printed it because it has to be rebuilt because out of alignment, the numbers, see? Like one is here on the top. Mm -hmm. One is going down towards the Two is okay. Three is supposed to be over here and four is supposed to be here, okay? And then this one is five with the arrows. And um, see, we got nine and 10. <laughs> we, we had it, you know, we had great discussions before this was taken off the glass. <laughs> and then at the bottom, this is interesting, at the bottom, on the side, on the bottom, there is a, um, action path, practice generosity, morality, development, forgiveness, and the Brahma Viharas and breath. There's an example of the Brahma Viharas and breath. You see at the bottom, you see it? Okay, where this line goes, number eight is down here on the bottom. And what it was trying to do, because the objections would fly up that the Brahma Viharas will not carry you to Nibbana. And we had to show on a line what was happening. So with the regular meditation, the breath meditation goes and uses the object is breath, 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 breath in one, two, three, and four, and breath in five, and breath in six, and breath is seven, and breath is eight. This, this chart is not really that good on the bottom. And then at eight, it changes that the object is mind and then you fall into cessation, okay? But when we go back here and look at the top of the line, we see metta. So loving kindness is for the development of the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. In the fourth, um, wait a minute. In the fourth, it changes to karuna and karuna is the fifth, right? Then mudita is the joy is the sixth, 
and Upeka is the seventh, and then what happens? Mind also becomes the same object. So the point is the two lines end with the same object and objective of falling over into um, falling over into loving. Uh, you, I can't make you guys move now. Wait a minute. Falling over and making. Um, falling down into cessation, it's just falling off into a sea, and then it drops off and goes up to Nibbana experience, and then the mind opens to the liberation. I should do that much. Okay, we'll step back up here for a minute. And this one detailed section, it shows you the jhana progression is 10. So after nine down there, 10, shows you first jhana and second jhana. And something you'll notice here, that first jhana is aligned with metta on the outside line. Second jhana is metta on the outside line, right? Loving kindness. Third jhana, loving kindness. Fourth jhana um, is the hot part of the highest part on the fourth one is um, meta that's as high as it goes okay and the body's gone between the third and fourth almost the fourth the whole body will be gone and then when the body disappears um, you should be able to read this if you can't read it you tell me and I'll take care of it and so I'm just like all right then Loving kindness moves into compassion, and compassion is aligned with um, the other the other jhanas as they go along. Now I don't know what's happening here, but I'm going to go back and stop the share. Okay, uh, so I don't know if I can get the share again for you or not. I can give you this in a no. See now it actually left the universe. Ulysses, send me a note to contikema2 at gmail, okay? And I'll take care of it, okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, no problem. Yeah, uh, send me a note, all right? Um, so Saturday we will do dependent origination. If all goes well, You'll ask a lot of questions that on Saturday, and then we can go back into foundation next week and keep going on on uh, closer to the uh, syllabus. We'll change around the syllabus a little bit because over the years we've learned more things than we knew when we created the syllabus originally. So we have some good subjects to put into some of the syllabus. Any other questions? No? Okay. Ready for closing. Okay, Banti? Uh oh, I think Banti went. <laughs> Not sure. Let's see. Banti? Okay, we're going to close, okay? Okay, no problem. Okay. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.